Okay, I think it would be good to start. So um, I am Michelle Byrne, I'm Director of UK New Artists, and this How to Get Into Music is part of a suite of uh, talks and workshops that we've been running for new artists and anybody who's interested in how to get into galleries, music, socially engaged practice, and we've run lots of topics. And this and our other um, conversations and talks are will and are available on our website if you want to go and check that out. So I want to say hello and welcome to everybody who's joining us and very much to the panel as well. Um, and just before we, I hand over to the panel, I just want to um, do some housekeeping with everybody. Um, and that is that live subtitling is available. So for those who require that, click the CC, uh, which is along the bottom of your screen, and that will switch it on to subtitles. The talk is being recorded and will be available, as I said, on our YouTube and website afterwards. You're welcome to leave your camera on or off, uh, whichever you prefer, and please keep your microphones muted unless you're invited to ask a question and do that by um, the little thumbs up in the reactions or uh, please reach out in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Um, all that myself and the panel will be providing audio descriptions. Um, so just to start off with myself, I am a woman in her 50s. I'm wearing glasses. I'm sat in an office in front of a window. I'm wearing glasses and I have short dark hair and I'm wearing a light blue top. So that's all the housekeeping and um, what I will do, I'm going to hand over to Shakayla now to introduce herself and her panel and I wish you all a really interesting afternoon and just shout if you need me. Thank you so much. Amazing, thanks so much Michelle. Um, hey everybody, good afternoon. My name is Shakayla Miraj, uh, my pronouns she, they. Um, I am a black woman, I'm wearing a purple ribbed um, turtle neck and off-white fisherman's hat and behind me there is some um, African print and I'm surrounded by some of my house plants because I'm a plant mum. It's good to meet you. Um, I'm just to give you a bit of background information about what I do, I am a cultural producer and I'm also the founder of Cube which is a Midlands-based music development agency. And we nurture and develop um, talent across the music industries, primarily supporting those who are marginalized and disenfranchised across the music industries. So those not only just in performance roles, but also those working behind the scenes. And we do that through industry information, industry development, workshops, events, courses, mentoring as well. And essentially what it is is we put on some dope spaces, we create dope spaces through an intersectional lens, um, which are community led and accessibility to the industry is really important to us. So we're just trying to make the industry a bit more fairer than it is currently. Um, so um, as Michelle mentioned, this panel is about how to break into the music industry. And just to give a bit of context before, I'd like to invite the panel today to introduce themselves. Um, it is about how to build authentic momentum in uber uber busy industry without um, sorry, an uber busy in uber busy industry. We will have time for questions at the end, so just please type them in the chat, or you can use the raise your hand button, and we will answer as many as possible. And then after the panel, there is a short writing slash reflection exercise on building a story with authenticity. You are welcome to participate. It's not compulsory, but if you connect slash curious about writing about yourself, then I do encourage you to turn up and show up. Um, but yeah, so without further ado, I would love to take this opportunity to invite our panel to introduce themselves, including what you do in music and if comfortable, your preferred pronouns and of course, provide an audio description of yourself. So can we start with Anais? I'm just gonna go in order of my screen. Hi everyone, my name is Anais. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she, her, and um, I'm wearing a black hoodie. I have long sort of red, orange braids 
and so sitting in front of some plants to my right there's a blue wall and to my left there's a pink wall um but yeah i'm an independent artist living here working out of london um i've been releasing through my own label now for um maybe about eight months um I used to be signed to virgin emi but have uh, kind of relaunched my career sort of through my own terms i'm originally french and senegalese but uh, grew up in, uh, in Dublin, in Dakar, and then in the United States. I attended uh, NYU's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music and then moved to London to, to pursue music. And yeah, I'm a part of the Key Change program as well for um, with PRS. I hope that says everything. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Screamer, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. hi, guys. Um, my name's Sean, aka Screamer, my production name. Uh, I'm sitting in a white room wearing a black t shirt with dreadlocks uh, in a bun, looking a bit wild. And um, I'm an Afro Caribbean male. And um, yeah, so I'm a music producer based in Birmingham. I am 33 now and I've been making music since I was like 14. 13, 14, started out in the playground, just messing about. And one thing led to another, it was either football or music. I didn't make it in football, so by default, it was music. So um, yeah, I've gone on to uh, work with various different record labels. I've, well, I was running a record label prior to COVID um, changing things. Um, and we was distributed through Warner ADA, um, besides that, I've, um, I'm a sound engineer as well, well, a mixing engineer, so I mix records and um, master records as well, and I DJ and songwrite and produce, so I'm a bit of an all-rounder, but um, yeah, that's me. Thank you, Screamer. Uh, Leah? Hey, hey everyone. I'm happy to be here. My name is Leah. I am based in Dublin. I am a white woman in my 30s. I am I've dark hair, black in a pony, some hoops and a black top. And my background is just, a, I was trying to think of this color earlier on. It's like a taupe, <laughs> taupe, gray, uh, with some pictures just hanging to my right hand side. I am an artist manager. Um, I'm a mother. I work for and run Here One. It's a music discovery and management platform. I am also part of Key Change. Um, and I've been working in the industry for about 10 years now. I kind of feel like I've only um, got going maybe the last five. I've been managing the last eight years. I'm currently managing four artists, three of them under Here One. Um, and with Here One, we how we discover artists is we do acoustic sessions. So along the lines of mahogany and color, not as well known as them, but we're doing our bit for independent artists over here. Amazing, thank you so much, uh, folks. So I feel like there's a lot to get through and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you all. Um, and as this is about how to break into the music industry, as you probably gathered, it's a pretty crowded place in this digital era. Um, and just to provide a bit of context, Spotify currently hosts 70 million tracks and that's 60,000 tracks being uploaded daily, which is nearly one track upload per second. And no doubt that figure is going to rise in the near future. And that's just one streaming platform. So I'd like to start with a pretty generic question, um, but I do believe it's crucial for any artist wanting to access the modern music industry. So starting with Screamer, what are the top three essentials needed in a toolbox for an artist to break into the music industry? In this day and age, I think you need to have some kind of uniqueness about you because, like, a lot of uh, although there is 6,000 songs released every day, I think like 58,000 of those songs sound the same these days. So, how are you going to like stand out to this oversaturated market? I think, for number one, I think you've got to have a USP, a unique sounding point to yourself, whether that be the way, and we're living in it. Um, like a visual time. So people go on your Instagram, they wanna see how like eccentric or interesting you are to look at or how well you've um, presented yourself. So I think secondly, you need to have a present that's like commanding or demanding, let's say. 
So people just look and think, oh, that's interesting. I want to hear what you have now if they don't hear you before they see you. And then um, thirdly, I think you, you've got to have really good music. You've got to have really good music. So that's great production because like music, the quality has stepped up a lot over the past like 10 to 15 years. When I remember Channel U days when it wasn't, people didn't have the best sound in music in the UK, especially. But now everybody, well, not, not everybody, but the majority of music I hear in new music, it's mixed down well, it's mastered well, whether I like it or not, the quality. So I think the quality and the, the overall production needs to be on par with what everything else that's, that's going on out there. Thank you. That's very much a, a producer viewpoint and I appreciate, appreciate that. Um, Leo, do you have anything, what do you think there are the top three essentials yeah. that an artist should have? I think there's a long list um, and to add on to what Screamer was saying, I think having a really good work ethic and drive is so important. Um, it's your business, it's your job, it's something you want to do for the rest of your life. I think they're two of the most important thing as well as the talent and the good stuff, you know what I mean? It all starts from your work ethic and drive and can you drive yourself? You know, a lot of musicians are working on their own, you know, and as a manager working on my own, it takes a lot of self drive and self motivation. But as well as that is knowledge, like get to know the industry, get to know the way the business works. Um, I know managers come on to help artists, but having a good idea as an artist and how the industry works and the different steps you need to take um, are key. That's amazing, thank you. Anais, would you like to add an artist perspective? <laughs> sure, um, I think having something to say, uh, having a lot of clarity about who you are as an artist and making sure you take the time to develop yourself and, and really um, knowing how to communicate what's important to you and why people should listen to your music or like who your music is for. So I think that's just a part of knowing yourself as an artist and doing that work. Um, I also think obviously like perseverance, I think it's, um, it is definitely also about enjoying the process because um, I think if we're too focused on the result, we'll actually miss like the parts of us that that do generate like the gem you know and and, and the diamond and, and I think like just being focused more on the process will allow any artist to persevere through the difficulties and to be willing to um, go through that development process and to ask themselves the right questions and not to jump in partnerships or uh, contracts with people that don't really get who they are you know so uh, yeah I would say those two are really important um, maybe a third one as well. Um, I, I think also discipline as well, which I think is similar to what Leah is saying in terms of work ethic. Um, yeah. Amazing, thank you. Um, so we hear this word authenticity a lot, right? And so I'm curious to know like, what does that actually mean and how does that translate into music? So we know it's a densely populated industry. So in what ways can artists stand out from the masses and shape an identity in music which reflects who they are authentically? Um, Leah. Thanks. Um, I think from a manager's perspective, um, a lot of standing out comes with knowing, you know, a lot of what Anais was saying, you need to, you need to hone in on yourself um, and understand why you're doing it. And if you have a good reason why, there's a reason, you know what I mean? There's a purpose there. And I think honing in on that and kind of getting rid of external forces for a little while even, just till you have that as well. And to realize as well, it can be project by project basis, the why, you know, this project can be this and this project can be this. It can, you know, if you're struggling with standing out as an artist as a whole, maybe your project can, you know, and kind of taking things from that and maybe pushing that and hopefully standing out that way. But I think, looking at what other people are doing and trying to copy and maybe taking little influences is fine but trying to do what people have already done just because it's been successful won't necessarily work for that for the for the next person sure sure yeah screamer how do you see this working in the context of producing music making music that that you want to make essentially um i think it's like 
competency like knowing your like from a production point of view knowing your your plugins your software your your programs knowing what the latest that's why i keep like young producers around me because they're always like well we still use that snare we don't use that snare anymore bro like we use this snare, and I, like it's knowing like what the, the the current sounds are to use to like not sound outdated so i think um really just stay up to date with with the the latest trends you know you don't have to sound like everybody else there is like trends that happen like you can't make 80s music in the 90s and you can't make 90s music in the 2000s and think that it's not it's not going to be unrecognizable unless that's the sound you're going for of course like there is there's differences in ages and in times and in sound so i think keeping up to date with 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 the times is very important and that from a technological point of view as well as like a skill set point of view and then um, understanding the theory behind what you're doing as well i think it's really important thank you um so we now with regards to social media we we can see it kind of like almost taking over everything that we do it influences a lot of things especially in the industry in terms of instagram and tiktok in terms of promotion branding connecting with fan base and also grabbing the attention of industry execs um there is a pressure for sure for artists to kind of like stay relevant um but at what cost so do you think it's necessary for an artist to release music consistently in order to stay relevant and keep up appearances or is less more um curious to hear uh, from you anais on this point um i think that question is actually a bit difficult to answer in the sense of um i just don't think it's black and white because i think that for some artists um it might take more time for them to create the work that they're doing and maybe the work that they do is quite substantial and it doesn't need to be um overfed to people and people can live with their music it depends on like how they express themselves in their entirety like if they use visuals and you know i think like a lot of music industry people would say yes absolutely like you have to stay relevant you have to keep pushing but i think it depends on kind of where you're at in your career and the type of artist that you are some artists um do do do, do that um to keep the attention of people but i i think it can if it's going to take a toll on the creativity or if it's going to dilute the the value of an individual song because there are songs coming out just all the time i i don't think it's worth it so i think it's really important for people to like kind of know where they're at in their journey like if they're at the really beginning if they're building towards an, an album release and all of that will dictate the sort of pace at which they should be releasing um and also the pace at which they're creating so um but yeah i think just generally i think the consensus right now at least what i'm hearing i'm getting a lot of advice so like you know just you want to just stay in the conversation but i think if you stay in the conversation with mediocre music i think it's better to come out with one incredible song and then take a one year break if that's what it takes you know um so yeah yeah i hear that do you think and anyone can answer this do you think that changes if you are working in the independent sector if you are releasing music independently versus releasing music under a major can i answer that real quick i i would say that yes because obviously when you're independent you're you don't have a large sort of income that's sustaining you over a long period of time so you have to kind of keep your business going and you the more songs you have out the more chances you have for sync the more chances you have for other partnerships the more chances you have for a song to stick and get pl playlisted and to pick up streams or, and all that so i think it is a bit i think there's a bit more of a, a pressure from a financial perspective if you're independent rather than if you're on a major thank you um so on the topic of uh labels um it's quite rare for a label specifically major labels to offer a development deal nowadays and there's an expectation in the modern industry that artists should come industry ready should have the package should have releases with track record or that kind of stuff and it's almost as though artists now need to have and well now need to create their own development plan so what are some of the key things that artists can do independently to develop themselves further and spark creativity beyond having conversations with themselves because we know that this can be quite a, a solo journey at times um and also particularly if you know said creative 
have limited access to budget and resources. Um, Leo, would you, would you like to answer that? Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's something that a lot of artists are feeling now lately. They're looking for something to spark. But a lot of mine would be, a lot of my advice would be to go go in, go, you know, go in, but then go back out. Put yourself, in, take yourself out of your comfort zone, meet new people, put yourself into collectives that are communities that are doing things that you like or things that you want to do. Because um, I know for me, when I put myself into positions like that, or even having a conversation. If I feel a lull, I'll jump on the phone with one of my artists and we bounce ideas. And by the time I get off the call, you've even this new lease of life, you know? Um, but I do think getting out of your comfort zone, spending time away from external sources to figure out yourself and what your goals are. Um, and even down to back to work ethic as well. And um, being a little bit hard on yourself as an artist, like schedule out your day, you know, and the way you'd work a nine to five, you know, doesn't have to be nine to five, but dedicate those hours, even if it's 20 minutes a day for your development, like you'd work on self-development, you know, get the books, read the articles, find your inspirations um, and literally business plan your career you know and what you want and when I know business plan when I use here business plan I ran because I hate the idea of putting everything in paper but make a mood board make you know and once you start feeding I love Pinterest boards and anytime I feel like I'm like I know I need a creative spark I'll get a mood board and then it instantly you start to see things come into life and it might spark some creativity some drive some motivation to um give you a guide on where you're going with development and where you want to be and that kicks off any development I think is just seeing where you want to be and making those little steps you know and also being patient these these steps can take a long time <laughs> sure sure it's not one size fits all this kind of artistic yeah. journey and stuff for sure anyone else would like to add I can say that um at least being independent and having a lot less resources than I did before. Um, I think it's, it is about being resourceful and it's about like creating opportunity around yourself and um, not feeling like things have to be handed to you. You know, you can ask questions, you can find people to mentor you, you can uh, spend time practicing, you can yeah, ask questions, go out, see things. Um, join conversations like this you know there's I feel like there's really so much out there now that um I know, I know that back in the day there were more like development deals but even still there's probably a lot of people projecting onto the artists like we're going to develop you into this right so the development is actually not coming from the artist the artist is not always blossoming in the way that would have been natural to them so um I think to realize like who is around you who is a part of your community that can like, actually nurture that process for you is like really valuable. And to realize that we're a lot, if we're not rushing, then we are capable of so much more. And there's so many great um, initiatives out there that are there to support independent artists. At least in this country, I can say there's, there's a lot. And um, cause I've seen them and I've benefited from them myself. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, to piggyback off what you just said, Anna, it's like, yeah, the great initiatives like the Arts Council and like the PRS funding, like there's so much funding out there to develop your creative practice. That's what the, the funding's even called. So, yeah, I think um, just keep an eye out for the different funds that are available to artists to develop themselves right now, because there is quite a few. And um, just be really, um, really honest with yourself about, is this me? I think a lot of people want to be artists, but like do you really believe that that's who you are and what, that's what you're born to be and if you do then you have to have a I'm gonna do what it takes mentality within your morals moral compass like I'll never tell you to do anything that's gonna be outside of your morals but within your moral compass like are you prepared I think you have to be prepared to do what it takes and um, whether you have a budget or not you do have social media which is free and a, a, quite a lot of people more than ever have came up off just social media just thinking of cool posts to do posting regularly and um, doing what it takes I see a lot of artists who who say they want it and say they want the big house and the, the deal and everything but I don't see them doing what it takes so it's like a contradiction so you really have to um, put yourself out there and it's a relationships business as well so 
it, meet the right people, go to the places where those people will be and cultivate the relationships to the point where you can just call them just to say hello, not just, they don't want to see your number on the phone and think, oh, what do you want? Because you only call me when you want something. Create the relationships to the point where you can just have general conversations without having to even ask for anything. I find that's where a lot of the best deals are done with those kind of relationships. Yeah, totally. It's um, definitely a relationship industry, you know, and it's like, for me personally, I try and build meaningful relationships, you know, and it's not always take, 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 you know, it has to be a mutually beneficial relationship because after all, we're all humans, we all have needs, we all have goals and dreams and desires, we're all trying to get somewhere for sure. And on the topic of accessing, you know, creative development funds by the public, PRSF, as you said, Arts Council, that's a, it's a, it's a good time to kind of plug this. We have a funding masterclass happening tomorrow. So, you know, if you're interested in how to like fund your next music project, definitely check that out tomorrow. Um, yeah, that's the really, really good points. And I guess, you know, the development never really stops regardless of what stage you're at in your career, right? You know, it's just have to stay open to it and embrace it and be really honest with yourself. Like, you know, as you said, Screamer, is this, is this who I really am? Is this where I really want to be kind of thing? It's really cool. Thank you. Um, Anais, I'm going to ask with regards to your, you know, your artist journey so far. Um, First, I want to just kind of like sing your praises in regards to like your recent music releases, uh, Super Dope. And of course, you know, they've received a positive appreciation from the industry and mm -hmm. listeners alike, I'm a fan. Um, they've also been independently released. Um, and my understanding of your music and who you are as an artist based on what you've perceived and what based on what you've put out into the world, sorry, is that you're an artist who's versatile and you transcend genres, right? And some of the themes that I've noticed that you explore through your music is your diaspora, authenticity, healing, and it's quite clear that you have a strong sense of self, right? And so I'm wondering if, well, I'm wondering like why you opted to go the independent route and was this always part of your career plan? And was this the decision, was this decision influenced by how you wanted your audience to connect with and experience your music? It's a pretty big question. So if you need me to say it again, I'm, I'm happy to do so. I, I do appreciate it's a big question, but I'm, I'm very curious. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your kind words. It really means a lot. Um, I have a tendency to ramble. So if I just go off topic, just like tell me to come back. But um, I would say that I always felt like the independent route was the right thing for me. So when I was like a bit younger and I moved to London, I was very much like, I do want to have a team and I did want to be with a label, but I always thought it'd be like an independent sort of much smaller structure. Um, and at the time I met this manager and, and he was like, you need to sign. Like we have this great opportunity to sign, you know, with Virgin EMI. And like, I feel like at that time I knew within myself that it wasn't right, but I trusted in the music industry people that, you know, if everyone was like you're hiring him as your manager so you should trust that you know that he does know where your heart is go ahead and um so i went ahead and did that and i i don't regret it because i feel like that was my trajectory and i needed to know what that looked like because in terms of me running my business now being an independent artist now i learned so much from actually being in the music and major label system sorry um i just figured out okay like this is how they do things and i'm able to kind of take that experience as if i had like interned at a label but instead i was just like the guinea pig you know myself and um so I'm grateful for that experience, but I did feel like for, since I was a kid, I was always like, I'm gonna have my own label. And like maybe one day, like when I'm in my thirties, I'll sign other artists. And um, so I think it was always there, but it just happened in a way where I actually did end up signing to the major. It really didn't work for me because I didn't feel like I could express myself in the ways that I needed to. I felt like they were very in a rush which makes sense because they're investing money and um, there was just quite a lot of issues to be honest and I'll spare the details but for me it was this, this was the only way forward the only way forward was independently and so um, so far everything I've done now um, has been fully independent like uh, self-managed everything and it's been 
uh, very fulfilling because I've been able to reconnect with what my intuition is and I've been able to move with my true like authentic self you know um, because there were just less voices crowding my decision making process and um, so it is definitely more it's very arduous because there's, uh, there's a lot to keep and stay on top of but it's also incredibly like it feels really good when you you when people connect with something and you're like okay like I did that you know and it was my truth and I stick to it I stuck to it um and I've kind of had to decide that I'm gonna do this in my own way and like if it becomes successful then great I'll feel good about it and if it doesn't I, I at least I can learn from it and I know that it was my own doing and it wasn't something that came from uh someone else pushing me into a specific direction and that doesn't mean that, that I don't work with people I do work with people I do take advice I do consult people but in the end I kind of go back to myself and I decide how I want to move forward um I don't know <laughs> what was the, uh, what parts of the questions that I missed yeah no that's good no um I think the other part was the second part of the question was um your decision to go that independent route um, oh, how I connect to my listeners, how you right? your audiences, and how yeah. you want them to experience your music, because that's really, I think, as I think you've got a really strong sense of identity, and your themes explored in your music are really strong and consistent. So the thing is, like you know, you said that I was a very versatile artist. I feel like mm, the thing about me, and maybe a lot of people, is that I, I don't know if everyone's like this, but I feel like I, I'm always changing. And I need to be able to reflect that in my music. And I, I didn't want to be trapped in like a specific genre. Um, and even some things that maybe I don't like as much now, I have to kind of admit that I was exploring that at that time. And I see music as a, as a means for exploration. But I think the most important thing about me, the thing that has been consistent has been my messaging and the, the values that I want to convey through my work has always been, yeah, that has never changed. I've always been about like liberation and healing and, and, um, and, and, and being truthful, I've always been interested in that because I think that that's what makes art interesting. And I also know that everyone doesn't think the same way. Some people, music is like a business. It's like, let's make these records, let's make this money. And I understand that and I, I respect that. For me, through my art, I really, because I'm sharing so much of myself, I, I need to feel like it's it's just, it's really truthful. So I've had to kind of readjust my um, expectations to a certain degree and to understand like where are the places where I feel like I can compromise or where are the places where I feel like I can't um, and that was like quite important and I do want my audience because the messaging is so important because I'm talking about liberation there was a very clear moment for me where I was like I can't go on stage singing about freedom but then off stage I'm feeling oppressed you know that doesn't there's that's not true and it's not right so um my work is always reflecting my life and i think by letting people in then we can build a real connection and they can see like the real thing um because i also feel like there's like a lot of um smoke and mirrors going on and with social media it can look like things are going one way but they're going another way and um, I love to let people into that process because I think the vulnerability is beautiful and it just works for me and how I want to move forward. But everyone's not the same. So it's, just, it's not like an advice or anything. It's just like how I, how I like to move. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's one thing I really admire is like to kind of own your narrative, own your truth. And it's artists like, it's a really vulnerable position to hold, you know, constantly, you know, having to put some of your like deepest, you know, thoughts, opinions, values, and in hopes that someone somewhere will connect with it, will resonate yeah, it's with it. Terrifying, right? It's terrifying, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's amazing though, and I honestly have a, a lot of admiration for artists who are just kind of fearless and relentless, or they might be scared, but just go for it anyway. You know, um, it's a, a lot of respect for that for sure. Um, Screamer. Um, just to kind of go back to the developing um, yourself, you formed a producer collective called Rura Squad, right? Correct me if I'm not pronouncing that. Uh, Rura Squad, yeah, it's a bit wild, a bit random. Okay. Cool. But yeah. yeah, 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 that's right. So I'm wondering in what ways has this developed you as a producer? Because you said you've been producing since, you know, you were a teenager and you like to surround yourself around, you know, younger producers to keep you fresh. So yeah, I'm wondering in what ways yeah. being part of a collective has helped you. 
Yeah, so um, yeah, it does go back to what I was saying about the the younger producers, like keeping me on my toes and letting me know, like, well, this is these aren't the sounds that we use anymore. Like, this is this this is the sound of the times. Because I've always been adaptable as a as a musician or as a producer, like, so whatever the time is, like, I can just mold myself into that and still have a unique way about it. I've always been able to do that, but um. In order to stay doing that, I think you have to surround yourself with fresh, fresh, um, fresh ears and people who are like currently, currently paying attention to all the small, minor um, changes that that are happening within the um, the production world that I might miss because you know I have different responsibilities and stuff. But some of these younger guys, they just like sit at the computer as I used to. They just sit at the computer and just make beats like all day, every day, as much as they can. I don't really have the time to do that as much as I used to. So it's great for me to be able to bounce off, bounce off these uh, younger producers and, and share the energy. And then likewise, I, I show them things that they might not know. And I have the wisdom and the expertise to share with them. But um, as a collective, like they're all a talented bun bunch of individuals. Like um, one of the, one of the producers, he's like recording Steph London at the moment for her latest um, music that she's got coming out. Another one works with like a lot of the biggest um, producers in America as well. And so like they're, they're, they are a really talented bunch. So I think it's great as a producer. Like I always used to think, oh, no, I'm just going to produce on my own because I want all the credit for myself. And it's me, 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 I, I, I. But that only got me so far. The more I started um, opening myself up to collaboration is when like more things started happening for me, I'd say. And, and we're living in a time now where like when you look at the credits of you, the biggest artist songs, you're going to see a, about 15 names or it could be more. So there is more so than ever, like there's a lot of people involved in making records these days at, at the top level. So um, from a production point of view, I'd say that to add for the producers out there to remember that we're in the song industry and not the, the beats industry. So it doesn't matter how great your beats are if if they only remain as instrumentals, because like that's that's not what the industry is really about. And that's that's the pocket you want to go into. That you have to learn how to transcend making beats into making songs if you want to like have a successful, profitable career as a producer. And that is get, getting the relationships with the A&Rs or getting the relationships with the publishers, getting the relationships, especially with the artists and being comfortable directing artists and um, building those relationships where you can tell an artist, no, no, do it like this, do it like that. And guiding them through that process. I think, um, yeah, now I have this team. I was, I've always, I was always that kind of producer anyway, but um, now I have a team, like it makes it even easier because everybody has great input. So I'm, I'm happy to like share the experience, to be honest. Thank you. Yeah, it's really important. And yeah, I've, I've always found it fascinating when I look at song credits and there's like loads of people, you know, contributing to one yeah. track, you know? So yes, yeah, yeah. people make sure you get your splits correct, get them recorded, yeah. paid, you know? Mm -hmm. um, You're muted. I am. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, Leah, yeah. um, thank, thank you, Screamer. Um, I was just uh, saying, I don't know how much you heard of that or didn't hear. I was no, saying, I didn't hear anything. I oh, thought my ears okay. was, my, I was, I was so confused. Yeah, it's after you said, uh, get your credits. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, get your okay. credits. Get your right, and then that's get paid. Yeah, get yeah. paid. Just, just get paid, you know, make sure yeah. you document, get your ISRC codes, all of that stuff, you know, get Yeah, paid. yeah, yeah. There, there, there are uh, forms that you can get, like song split forms that mm -hmm. I know it's a very awkward process when you're creating to be like oh yeah before you go can we just sign this song split just to say that i did this and you did that but you have to get used to like having those awkward moments uh, in the in the earlier part of the process as much as possible like you don't want to do it at the start and like ruin the energy and the vibes and say oh, i want this but just get used to that uncomfortable stage of okay well this is what i believe i'm entitled to for this and having those awkward uncomfortable conversations as producers I think we have to get used to that because we could just get taken advantage of which happens a lot yeah for sure it's, it's a business at the end of the day and it's your business you know so it's trying like remove that kind of taboo around having conversations around money because 
creativity is not free and time surely ain't free either. Thank you. Um, Leah, so you manage a portfolio of artists under your management company, Eight Music, and you also offer a range of like full label services, including the development of up and coming artists. Um, could you tell us more about how your role as a manager helps to nurture and develop the artists that you work with? Yeah, of course. Um, I love the whole development stages of an artist's career. Um, and I work, all of my artists, we started off um, like God, I think one of my long, I think we're together like maybe five years this year. And it's been such a process and such a journey. And we were partners in a way, you know, and it's I like all of my artists, but I think one of the, one of the many roles a manager has um, is being, having their back, you have their back. And especially when you've worked with them from early development stages, they need someone that they can trust. Um, you know, a few of my artists would have been, you know, a, a promised the moon and the stars and then only to have it blow up in their face. So I think being someone that they can trust um, with their career and with their goals is always massive. Um, but as well, I remember actually when you first got in touch, Shakela, um, I looked up the UK and a website and they have a manifesto there. And their manifesto in the we we believe, we love, we believe, and we support or commit. And I think they're the traits, they're the roles that artists in development stages need. They need someone that loves what they do. They need someone then that will believe what they believe in what they do and that they're capable of it. And that you're committed to helping them along that way, along whatever they want to do. And a lot of my artists are independent and will stay independent for a long time. Um, and it's knowing their goals and really hearing them. And I actually asked one of my artists last night, I said, um, what is it? What is it that you, you know, we're, we're getting on well. I wasn't looking for compliments. Just seeing if it was the same as what I felt. And I think it's hearing your artists, it's hearing the goals, staying um good communication make sure there's always that communication and if goals change there's a lot of pressure on artists to stay relevant and it's being open about okay Leah maybe I don't want to do this and it's like okay we'll switch it around we'll find another way um but I really think my role um as a manager is in the nurturing and development side is all about just hearing them being there for them and then also having that split side where you're aware of what they can do and the opportunities and giving them opportunities and always kind of keeping things going, but also letting them know that it's okay to stand still or to, you know, be a little bit quieter. Um, overall understanding, just hearing someone listening, being empathetic as well um, is key. You know, I don't like this. I know we all want to make money from music, but I do like what Anais was saying, it's finding your finding your groove, you know, and being able to do it the way you want to do it and trusting in that process and having someone there that's on that journey with you, but can also give you a kick up the uh, whenever you need it is really important because you know, you know, it's like, I know your goal. I know you want this. You're just maybe slacking a little bit. And I don't think anyone can say that to an artist, only someone that's been there from the get go, you know? Um, so I take, I take pride in being there for my artists throughout the whole thing and being able to push them when they need a push but also being able to be very understanding. Um, and I think that's key in an artist manager relationship. Like you need, you need your person, you need a match. It'll never work with someone if it's forced. Um, but, but yeah, I think that did it. Did I answer that? <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> and, and you answered yeah. really, really well. I had my follow-up notes around, you know, how do you resolve conflicts and all that? But to be honest, you sound like a unicorn of a manager, you know? And it, so, it's been a journey you know it's been a journey and you can only I think um I don't get too hard I'm like a, you know exactly I know Mars know exactly what they're getting when they when I come on board you know I'm still learning I'm never I wouldn't like I'm not I wouldn't be no do you know what I'm experienced in what I've experienced you know and I can only act on that um but, but yeah, conflict and all communication, just be out, be out there, say what you have to say, going back to the splits and stuff like that. I'm constantly just saying, the minute you go in, I can do it. Just know that someone has to do it before it blows up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a good artist manager friend of mine, he always says, you know, he manages some high profile artists and he's always said, you know, ultimately, you know, my business is to create, you know, business development opportunities for my artists to support their career progression. But I have to remember that I work for them, you know, so mm -hmm. I do need to, it's, it is about 
it is a, it is a listening game more so than trying to push things onto them that they might not necessarily feel this right fit for them. So yeah, yeah. more ethical artist manager relationships, please. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, this question is open to anybody to answer. Um, and it's, a, it's quite a, a common question, but again, essential. At what point do you think an artist needs to be looking at management, deals, labels, funding, publisher? I can jump in. Yeah, please, please. Um, I think it's um, case by case. Um, even going from the artist I manage, um, I there've been some where it's like the very start. They've probably just done one song or had a YouTube video up and I was like, come here, <laughs> let me work with you. Um, and then others, they come to me with like projects, you know, it's like an EP and you need it. But I think if, if you feel a bit stuck, if you know somebody can work with you, maybe you don't necessarily jump into a management agreement, but maybe kind of see how it goes. You know, okay, this is development. Let's see how we get on in stages. Um, but then again, do I would always recommend artists to do the work, do what a manager would do for as long as you can do it, as long as you have the headspace, as long as you're still being able to create. Um, but then if it gets too much, that's when you need a manager. But knowing what a manager does before getting a manager gives a bigger understanding and will help you manage, co-manage your own career. Yeah, that's brilliant. I, I've always been a believer of, um, you know, if you're if you're working in an industry, it's your industry, so get to know all of the all of the sides of the industry, so nobody can exploit you. It doesn't mean that you have to do all of them, but until you're in a position where you can kind of expand your team, delegate, you know, at least you have at least a, a working knowledge, a foundation of knowledge to be able to say, that's right, hmm, that doesn't sound right. So yeah, that's brilliant. Anyone else? Have any um, I think, I think um, you, if, like, before you, you get a manager for an artist, I think you need to have something to manage. So, um, like, so like you could have a lot, a lot of music on your computer, but that still, I don't think, in my opinion, makes you manageable. Like, I think you need to, like, have, just have a, a few things worked out in your own mind, like, i.e., like, what's my image, like, genuine, what's my genuine image, and, how am I portraying myself? Because you don't want somebody to come in. I think some artists want a manager to come in and be their, their parent and be like, yeah, wear this and look like this and sing this and say it like that. Like, but really I think the great artists, like they just use all of this, the, the, all of these things and these traits and this wisdom, like it just comes from within. And the, the managers should see that and, and, um, be attracted to that so I think it works best more often than not when you get approached by a manager or you get approached by people saying we want to work with you and you could just put out you could be one of the lucky people who puts out one song and that gets loads of traction and it's your first song it's rare but it does happen if that's the case then cool but other than that like you're probably gonna have to do a, a, quite a bit of groundwork before I think you're you're even manageable and even for the funding and stuff, a lot of the funders want to know, okay, well, what have you done as to why you should get the funding over the 100,000 people who have done a lot of stuff that's also applied? So I think, yeah, I think you have to put in a certain amount of groundwork before, before you should think about doing any of these other things. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely about making your case known and clear and loud as to like, you know, why you deserve further investment essentially. And that's not just investment in funding, but just investment in people's time, energy, contacts, you know, um, for sure. Um, just, I got one more question before we open the floor for uh, folks to ask their questions. Um, do you have any advice for anyone who's feeling a bit stuck in their career right now because of their, because of, because of their identity, they may be struggling with you know, how they present themselves, their authenticity. Uh, any advice on, on that? Uh, Anais? Um, I guess I would just say to always go back to the why, you know, why you started doing what you do and what what is it that motivates you to do it? Because um, I think a lot of the time the, there's a lot of pressure to create or to achieve certain things and that ends up like eating away at our soul. But 
um, if you can go back to yourself and say, okay, this is why I, and you just return to that place and always look at the things that matter to you. You know, if something really, it, if something is, is on your heart and it really um, takes up a lot of your like mind space and heart space, um, whether it's identity or anything, that's, that's what you should channel, not what you should channel, but it's something you can use to channel your creativity. Um, and that can be your message and that can be, um, yeah, you know, you're why. So I'll just say like, keep curious about the things that like are interesting to you, you know, and that move you and that, um, yeah, consume you, I guess. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, Leo? Um, I'd suggest to, I know someone brought it up earlier, ask questions, ask for help. Like I used to just think I should know everything. <laughs> Um, but then I got to a point where I met all these other amazing managers and they were women as well. And I was asking for help and the way that they would jump to help, you know, like I would, you know. Um, and I think even reaching out to other artists or um, anyone in your circle and just expressing that feeling, sometimes even just expressing it can can open, um, open up a, a space for something new to come in, you know, and um, just being aware of it. I think is important um and then going back to your why is so so important because that's why you do it yeah 100 for sure as uh, sure screamer calling you by your government <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> yeah I, I definitely agree with the the why am i doing this aspect of it all that's that's it, like the huge question that that will answer a lot of questions in itself but um yeah, I think a positive mental attitude will take you a long way just in anything you do in your life. And I say, just for thinking a positive thought for 17 seconds will lead on to another positive thought. So um, I've researched some uh, mindset techniques that you can do and uh, mindfulness techniques that you can do away from your music to get your, your mind into a place of peace and contentment with yourself. And also watch, watch um, interviews and uh, documentaries on your favorite artists as well, because you'll see, you'll get an insight into how they are and what makes them tick and what makes them who they are. And that that should inspire you to be like, okay, so it is okay to be different. It is okay to be unapologetic myself. So I think, yeah, you need to remember that, you know, as humans, we're not that different from each other. And, that um, like Anais was saying, that vulnerability, like when we show that, like we we relate to it when we see it. It's like, oh wow, I, I wish I could do that, but you can do that if you want to do that. So um, yeah, just be inspired by the people I do and having what you want to do and to have, and just allow yourself to open up, being that on and doing that and having that. If that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, 